This is a production of the Hardway HQ Podcasting Network. Welcome, everyone, to another edition of Unfiltered here, HardwayHQ.com, via the Hardway HQ Podcasting Network. You can find this podcast through iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, iHeartRadio, the vast gamut of podcasting applications, as well as the aforementioned HardwayHQ.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok at HardwayHQ, Instagram at the Hardway HQs, if there's any other one. Advertising concerns, hate mail, John at HardwayHQ.com. That's J O N at, don't actually write at, use the A with the circles around it. Cool gimmick, cool shtick, cool deal, baby. John at HardwayHQ.com. I'm John Harder here in the beautiful, luxurious Hardway HQ studios, bringing another edition of Unfiltered. And again, this is the second edition of. Indie Wrestling Month for the month of October as I talk about different timelines that I've experienced in the world of professional wrestling during my first real chapter and run as I my toe itches. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, uh, last week I talked about Ace from 2010, 2011. I'm going to go to 2010 and I'm going to talk about a company in the Northeast that I performed for that not many people remember. And it's a damn shame. The BWO, the Body Slam Wrestling Organization. Uh, ran by Richie Rotten, who, uh, Richie Rotten was one of the guys, he ran Body Slam U, he did New Jack City back, and they always talk about New Jack City, based out of Philly and in South Jer- in South Jersey, uh, that's where he met Magic, um, he, he was running the BWO school, Body Slam U, and I came in contact with BWO for the first time after I got let go from Ace in, uh, 2008, and, uh, Dan Murdoch, who had the same fate, was training at BWO, I believe it was Hasbrook Heights, and um, they weren't in Elmwood Park yet, and uh, Murdoch was like, do you want to come with me and you know, meet the guys, maybe learn the business that way? I'm like, sure, why not? So I went, and I had met Richie Rotten, I think Chaos was the booker at the time, another performer for BWO, um, you know, they had their thing, and I started learning a little bit of the business, and uh you know, was BWO the greatest place on earth? No. But at the same time, it was a place for young, aspiring guys just to get work, just to learn. And BWO had their own set of loyal guys, which I really respected. And I went back to Ace around 2009. And I still stayed in kind of with BWO. I went to check out some shows. I just wanted to see what was going on from time to time. And around 2010 was when uh, I really started doing a lot more with the promotion on a, a commentary basis, ring announcing basis. Thanks to the greatness of Tommy Hunter and uh, the late, great Tommy Hunter, who people, you know, I wish people would have gotten to know a lot more. He sadly left several years ago. I did an unfiltered on Tommy Hunter um, last year. So uh, please check that out. I get stories about how great this man was and how much of an influence he was on me. Uh, he got me doing commentary. I would always go up to Parsippany to his, um, or Wayne, to go up to his uh, uh, condo, and we would always just do a commentary, and, and various cast of characters would come in and do commentary. But at these live shows, in 2010 in particular, I really felt BWO took the next step, and it was a lot of different reasons. Obviously, Dan Murdoch, um, who, Babyface Ben. <laughs> Babyface Ben. He 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 just had you just he just has this simple good hearted demeanor about him in front of a crowd when you go out and you know he's always trying to find himself. I think himself was just being himself, and I love that about about uh, about Moish. So he he instantly got popular and he was a hardworking guy. He laid it all out there every single night, and you had a lot of foils to play off of. Uh, Dom Montoya of the Black T-shirt Squad back in the day, uh, the. Early 2000 Indies in Chikara with Mike Quackenbush and Reckless Youth. Um, a huge Don Montoya guy. I actually enjoyed picking his brain a little bit about the black t-shirt squad. I'm a huge mark for that. I, I'm a huge mark for, for um, Quack's Creative Ventures and uh, Montoya. So Don Montoya being part of BW was awesome. Uh, Steve Off. You know him now as part of that American Murder Society with... Uh, Alex Ryman, I want to call him Aaron Bradley so bad. But Steve Off was still trying to find himself in that time frame. He had the entire Off family. He had Hands Off and he had, uh, he was doing, I remember in 2010, he was doing a YouTube show called The Gun Show because Steve Off was jacked to the gills, brother. And Steve had his like web show and he kind of used BWO. I wish he would have done more with uh, one of the alternate side characters on the show, El Rotundo Genioso. 
And I reference that to Steve Off from time to time. But Steve Off was a former BWO champion, and you know he his old man was his bodyguard, Big Bob Arian, who was who was like six foot three to me and just jacked to the gills, and just a, a genuine he, he's a nice dude, you know, from I met him. And, you know, just the cast of characters that came around at this point, Richie Rotten, you know, would just turn into a, a, a Rudo, a villain. Um, you had you had a bunch of young guys around this BWO time that I really want to illustrate. Um, at the time, his original name was Mongo, but he became Big Money Marconi, which in turn translated into TJ Marconi, who uh, you might recognize on the Indies for, for you know, doing his thing six 6'6". It's a, a, a monster in the game at that time, especially you know, young, first year in the business, uh, wealth of potential behind him. You had Darius Carter, who trained at the BWO school under Nunzio and Richie Rotten. Uh, Darius uh, gained his ability in pro wrestling, and this was his first year where he really got a chance to break out and do some things, especially with BWO, and I'm going to get to that point in a moment. Uh, you also had Ray Ray Mars. The first sponsor of the Hardway Podcast. Probably one of the only sponsors ever of the Hardway Podcast. Double R was a rock star who came out to Cat De Luna Unstoppable. And he was just a, 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 a fun-loving, just just goofy goofball. And, um, you know, he, he found his niche in BWO as a U.S. champion. And they had the United States title. And he found his niche there, which I always uh, appreciate. And Ray Ray worked hard. And there was just uh, the cast of characters. Nick Saint. Uh, Glenn Ulrich. Uh, was Glenn Ulrich? Yeah, Glenn Ulrich, who was the BWO owner. He's like 22 years old. He was the BWO owner. Uh, you also had uh, Nick Saint, who not many people remember. The five-star superstar Cobra, uh, which was an acronym name, believe it or not. I forget what it was. But you had the Smooth Savage, Johnny Mongwe, a.k.a. Jocka. Mm-hmm. You had him there. Um, and and last but certainly not least, how can I forget? He's not really wasn't really necessarily a young man back then, but he was young in the game. Uh, preacher Phineas James with his with his wife Arlene. And uh, if you want to see where Preacher really found himself, he found himself as a part of that BWO locker room, owning that you know being a uh, investor in the company. More importantly, just being a great heel. And you know he he didn't do too much, but. He, he did enough. He got himself, you know, whenever it was a live event, he got reactions. And that's all you can ask for. And around this time period, BWO is running out of Elmwood Park. And they're doing shows in Lodi. They're doing events all over the place. And DVDs are getting released. I know uh, uh, people were actually purchasing the DVDs of BWO shows. And I'm doing commentary with, you know, with Tommy Hunter at times. But my main cohort destruction on commentary was... Uh, I miss this guy a lot. Tony Schaff. Da 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 da. da. You're gonna get the Schaff. I I. <laughs> he was just this old, timey Italian guy. He was just uh, like slapsticky. He was like the Italian Bobby Heenan, the older Bobby Heenan, you know. And he was just a sweet man behind the scenes. When he gets in front of her, <laughs> had the sunglasses, that backwards hat on, and and and, and just a suit. And he was just, he got it. The, the old man got it, and uh, he passed away a few years ago, and uh, he was just a genuine good guy. And when he came over, he did commentary. Might not have known the world about wrestling, but he was funny, and he knew to be a good foil. And I, it's kind of where I learned that face heel dynamic on, on commentary with Tony Schaff. And for me, BWO was a place where it doesn't get enough recognition because they did try different things, and they had their own names. You know, they had their own guys where they were BWO guys. And none was more uh, important than, one of the, I think, one of the most fun nights in wrestling I've ever had was uh, August 6, 2010. I made sure I checked back on YouTube because I found a recap video. BWO ran a show called Mayhem on the Gridiron, but it took place, it took place in uh, Woodbridge, New Jersey, like one of the subsets, uh, I think Port Reading, I believe it was called, and it was at a football field of like, 250 people were there at this event. And the main event was a ladder match between Darius Carter and TJ Marconi, their first main event. And But this whole night was filled with with countless names. Richie Rotten teamed up with a football coach to face Johnny Mongway and a football coach. Uh, I believe a triple threat match that involved uh, uh, Showtime Sean Sheridan, who at this point became this just 80s nerd, facing off with uh, Glenn Ulrich and... 
um, there was somebody else involved in that match. I'm trying to remember. Might have been Nick Saint. Off the top of my head, yes. Um, Joey the Bull was, I believe, was on that card. If he wasn't, he had to be lurking somewhere because we we always, you know, as a rib with all of us because Joey was just a nice guy. But you know, in his matches, he always did like like thirty clubs in a match, forearm clubs. So we actually had between us the Joey the Bull uh, club meter, and he would always do clubs in his matches. Um, you know, just Steve Off was on the show, uh, Glenn Ulrich. They were, like, Steve Off was just one of those guys, man, that, that got it, that understood it. James Weck was also on that show. The Weck Face Killer. <laughs> and he had his own theme song, and it was, you know, he was an interesting character, James Weck. Uh, he faced Richie Rotten, but the three main matches on that card, obviously, was Darius Carter and TJ Marconi. Uh, the second one was Dan Murdoch. Defending his BWO championship against Corvus Fear, aka Eric Corvus. Uh, and it was just a fun match. And that was a big memory for me because uh, it actually incorporated uh, Murdoch's father, Dusty Don Murdoch. Uh, Don, and he, you know, he was, it, it's crazy because he was gone within seven months, I'm going to say he was gone. And, uh, and he managed Murdoch and, Fired him up. Go kick his Yankee ass because it was the Southern shtick. And Murdoch came and fired up and won. And that was a, a moment that I'll never forget. Cause I got Because I got the call that one. And it meant the world at the time. And um, again, a few months later, he was gone. So, And the final match of that day was a personal favorite wrestler of mine, Chris Hero. Uh, at the time, ROH Tag Champion. All that jazz. Going one-on-one -on -one with Preacher and a... And a total old school shtick. And Chris Hero's genius came out to play. And Chris Hero is an absolute stud. And the fact that he made Preacher look like a million bucks. It's all you can ask for, man. Dude, Chris Hero's the man. And the fact using a BWO ring meant the world. And it wasn't, you know, it was just, it, it wasn't about them bringing in names. It was about the talent they did. And they drew 250 at a football field in Woodbridge. I mean, that's that's impressive. And, you know, from that, they built a connection with NWA on fire. It's a Valdi family who was based out of Maine, and they looked to try to build a little connection with their shows, and I appreciated it. I really did. I respected it a lot. And slowly but surely, BWO started fizzling or fading down, and uh, I also have to mention the Saints of Lodi, Dan Marquez and uh, Tristan Law were a team in that time period, too, and Tristan Law became BWO champion. It was awesome, but... You know, BWO started fading out from that Elmwood Park area. Um, a lot of issues came into play. And ultimately, you know, Preach had the company. But at the same time, uh, Darius Carter became the last BWO champion on an episode of Doja Wars, if I remember properly. Uh, CZW little little thing. So, overall, uh, BWO had an impact on me because it showed me that the, the old school shtick can work. You can mix it up with the newer young guys. You could teach them the way in a, in a different mindset. Local Jersey Indies. Just crowd reaction. Easy, easy heat. And uh, Richie Rotten Preacher deserves a lot, a lot of credit for molding that environment. And uh, I was happy to have been there and to have grown. Being able to grow into there to become a better talker and more confident in myself and my abilities. And, uh, you know, I just, I just wanted to give... A special thanks to BWO and to Richie Rotten and to uh, Steve Off. And, you know, you see Steve Off now doing pro wrestling magic with that, that cast of characters. Anthony Ilano, if I probably said his last name wrong because I cannot pronounce Ivano. I probably pronounce last names wrong completely. Like Hughes. I can't say Tim Hughes. Who, by the way, Aaron Bradley, he's talking trash about pork roll again. Um, but just BWO was a, a, a unique experience for me. And, um, you know, nothing ever beats those nights at the Elmwood Park, Knights of Columbus, or VFW Hall. And just simple wrestling with the short ring. Kind of that short ring actually inspired Project Diverge. So, um, there's nothing to take from it. But I appreciated what BWO did. And, you know, I would, I, I wish Richie Rotten and those guys would get their due. Because they, they deserve it. They you know, they're interesting characters and they're a place to work. And it was just fun experiences, you know, for me. And I never had any heat or nothing like that. So just good experiences. But I personally want to say thank you to that, this gang, this crew. And, uh, um, 
I, will, I wish I was in contact with you more, but Dems the roads. I'll see you around uh, when we come around. So, oh my goodness. But this has been unfiltered. Um, this is Indie Wrestling Month. Next month, we're talking to Baldy Family and NWA on Fire. So, that's going to be a blast. So, with that said, this has been unfiltered. I'm John Harder. Hardwage Q. Dot com. <laughs>